Welcome to the uh, Unitarian Alliance meeting. We meet here every month uh, on the uh, third uh, Tuesday of the month. And uh, tonight uh, it's Richard Williams, and he's speaking on small territories versus uh, liberal succession, uh, li liberal empires. Uh, the problem of succession, I guess. So. Um, thank you very much, uh, David. Um, I, I got thinking about this um, due to the whole um, uh, Brexit debate. Um, I myself voted for Brexit, uh, but that was before I realised uh, the planes would be grounded and we'd have an epidemic of super gonorrhea, but there we go. <laughs> That's easy to avoid. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, um, for me, there were several key reasons for that decision um, to back Brexit. Uh, firstly, obviously, um, there was the benefit from stopping sending roughly 10 billion a year from UK taxpayers to Brussels. Um, secondly, uh, there was the prospect of freer trade with the rest of the world, getting rid of this protectionist racket, which is the EU Customs Union, and, and through that also benefiting um, developing countries by getting rid of these protectionist barriers. It's not obviously not just the tariffs, it, a lot of the non-tariff barriers are far more serious, the uh, regulatory hurdles that the exporters have to pass. So this is potentially a huge, huge benefit from Brexit. Um, thirdly, and probably the largest kind of medium-term economic benefit would be um, domestic deregulation. So by leaving the um, European economic area, the single market, um, getting rid of all this absolutely horrendous um, EU red tape. And a lot of people are sceptical about this because unless you actually work in a particular industry, or you've studied a particular sector of the economy, people just don't have a clue about how pervasive all this regulation is. It's, it's really, really terrible. So it's, you know, when someone in, in Cornwall can't afford to pay their water bills because it's, you know, 500 quid a year for a one-bedroom flat, that's because of EU regulation pushing uh, electricity prices up. One of the craziest ones, um, one of my favourites, is the um, EU Biofuels Directive, which across the whole of the, the block costs something like 15 or 20 billion euros a year, so quite a lot of money. It means you have to have a certain amount of uh, biofuels in the in the mixture of your, your petrol and diesel. And the uh, European Commission's own study actually found this was um, increasing CO2 emissions because it was causing Filipinos to you know, slash and burn the rainforest. But of course, by the time they realised that, they'd already created this vast biofuels industry that was processing the stuff. And so they couldn't actually get, roll back the regulation. So you know, we're so with this. But it's just, it's just typical of the kind of thing we get with, uh, with Brussels. Um, obviously, the question is, will, um, will the UK government actually rescind a lot of this stuff? And that's where a bit of pessimism sinks in. But you'd only have to get rid of quite a small percentage for there to be major economic gains. Just the really crazy stuff, in, <laughs> in effect. <clears throat> but finally, I think this is a, a neglected... Um, point. But I think there's also a kind of long-term uh, geopolitical rationale for, for Brexit. And that's the obvious development of what has been called an EU super state. Effectively, you could almost call it an empire, but it, this um, process of ever closer union with more and more power being drawn into the, the centre of, of Brussels. And you see you know, signs of this with the, the new plans for the Eurozone, where they're going to create, pushed by Emmanuel Macron, inevitably enough, and backed by, by Merkel, though with a bit of reticence in Germany. Um, they're going to create a common Eurozone budget um, and increase, basically, centralised control of the, the member states' budgets, people in the Eurozone. So it's effectively moved, a stepping stone towards a, an EU super state. And even more worrying, perhaps, is um, EU uh, Defence Union. Um, and the bizarre thing is the UK is still signed up to that. So these are, you know, what Nick Clegg de um, said was a myth. The, the idea that there's going to be an EU army is pretty much out in the open now. And what they're doing is deliberately merging all the uh, defence industry procurement processes. So it's basically one European defence industry. So effectively um, just through the supply chain you'll, you'll inevitably mean that no one country can really separate itself off in terms of defence and foreign policy. 
And the, the worrying thing in the long term, of course, is this um, EU army and this defence policy could be used to squash uh, dissenting nation states, uh, member states who don't follow the EU line are already seeing you know, sanctions, not particularly serious ones, on, on countries like Poland and Hungary uh, who don't toe the EU line. Um, but this is kind of a, a difficult area for um, sort of classical liberals, libertarians and so on um, because uh, obviously you could say that the supranational institutions like the EU in some cases can be a constraint on, on the terrible things that uh, particular um, member states or smaller units can get up to if they don't have these constraints from a higher body. So this is kind of the, the nub of the issue. So um, some people will say we need kind of a, a liberal empire that's going to enforce classical liberal ideas or libertarian ideas, obviously not anarchist ideas, on, on, on the sort of um, a, a wider territorial area. And this is, this is better than sort of letting small jurisdictions um, essentially have some quite appalling um, policies. Um, so this, this is the key. So the, I think the argument for secession, one of them is based on economic incentives, which is um, that it would tend to increase uh, competition between jurisdictions. Um, so as long as you assume a certain level of uh, you know, mobility of capital and labour and so on, and people just... Um, it means that there are quite strong incentives for, for countries to adopt um, pretty good policies such as lower taxes and deregulation in order to attract uh, business and talent from, from other uh, territories. So um, this is, a, in a sense, a way of ensuring that uh, government is constrained by competition. So government can't really increase too much because it, it shoots itself in the foot if it starts deterring um, business and so on to move into the more um, libertarian territories with, with lower taxes and um, more sensible regulations. I think another aspect of this is, which is important, is what you might call market segmentation. So if you think people have different preferences about the kind of environment or political environment they'd like to live in, um, and you, the problem is that empires uh, or these supranational states tend to enforce some kind of one-size-fits-all policy. And once again, we see that with the Eurozone, where um, obviously you have very different cultures in relation to debt in different areas of, of the EU. Um, for example, Ireland is much more sort of Anglo-Saxon uh, sort of attitude to debt and so on. Um, and you saw this massive bubble erupting there, there with... M2 rising at about 40% a year, and the same in Spain and Portugal. And you also have different cultural characteristics in, in other ways as well, and also different um, economic influences from surrounding countries, which will, will mean that one size fits all isn't entirely appropriate. So it's no, it's no coincidence that all four corners of the Eurozone have hit major problems, including Finland, which isn't really talked about. So Finland's been in a, a long depression, uh, just the same as some of the Southern European countries have been as well. It's the, the, reason, the reason we have a one-size-fits-all monetary policy, it just doesn't suit these uh, peripheral countries that might be doing loads of trade with Russia, for example, like Finland does. Um, <coughs> yeah, and a, another advantage, I think, of um, secession and splitting things up into smaller jurisdictions is... Um, you uh, do get a far more um, experimentation than you would with one size fits all uh, big empires. And I think it's sort of, you know, this sort of fatal conceit that um, there's sort of uh, a certain model that's ideal for this huge territorial area um, like the EU, whereas um, with changing conditions and so on, I mean, these, all, these, these centralized empires also become sort of very ossified and moribund and bureaucratic. Whereas um, if you have sort of more flexibility and more, more competition and more of these units, then um, obviously you can see some of them adapting quickly to changing economic and cultural and political conditions. 
And then what you see is a, a process of um, emulation and evolution. So what works will then be copied by other units and that will then um, spread around and with, with benefits from this experimentation process. Um, I mean, rather than sort of arrogantly assuming there's some sort of perfect model that will work. Um, another important uh, issue is just having an escape route from potential tyranny. Um, so the fact that there would be places outside these empires that aren't controlled. And obviously the, the danger is, the biggest danger for, in that respect is um, global government, where basically there will be no escape. If this global government turned bad, then it would be very difficult to get away from it. You know, perhaps you'd have to sort of go into the middle of nowhere. You might, you might get away with and live a primitive lifestyle. But that's, that's going to be um, really difficult. So there are numerous reasons to support this. But now I'm going to come and talk about some of the problems with smaller competing units. Um, and one of them is an economic problem, and that's that um, they would um, typically lack economies of scale um, compared with these much larger units, these um, empires. So um, if you take China, which is, it, it is an empire because um, you know, the Han Chinese area is a very small part of eastern China. They've expanded massively to the south and, and west and, and the north as well. Um, but the fact that they can, um, you know, they have maybe 1.2 billion people in quite a small area means they can enjoy enormous economies of scale. And you wouldn't get these necessarily with, with very diverse uh, jurisdictional units. And that's a big economic disadvantage. And that's why if you look at some of these smaller countries, um, they tend to, um, if they are wealthy, they tend to be either tax havens of some sort or, or natural resource exporters. Um, take somewhere like Iceland or Chile, for example, these peripheral, small peripheral countries. Um, but if you don't have those sort of advantages, then potentially you're at a massive disadvantage not having these economies of scale. And also the related issue of agglomeration economies, which are where you get these clustering benefits of having lots of industries and firms in close spatial proximity from one another. Um, and once again, you know, some, some, somewhere like uh, China has these uh, boatloads of this. It means that you, if you want to produce some sort of complex product, you can get all the subcontractors uh, in from your this one territorial unit with, with low friction. Um, and this is also a massive uh, generator of, of wealth, which is a massive advantage that, that empires get. But more than that, I think uh, a bigger worry, um, oh yeah, I would say as well, if you do have some sort of um, enforcement of consumer preferences. So um, if you think about these sort of big government systems, they, um, they kind of force uh, consumption into a fairly narrow channel, something like housing or transport is more or less centrally planned, even in quasi neoliberal economies. And this is a way of, uh, this is also related to the economies of scale as well. Whereas you have much more um, dispersed preferences in a, a freer situation with lots more variation between units, you wouldn't necessarily get the this um, economies of scale in consumption. You know, at the extreme, you had the East Germany where you were only allowed sort of one type of chair or one type of car or one type of, uh, and obviously that had its problems in itself. But, and nonetheless, there are these issues with economies of scale that you won't get. Then the, there's the issue of trade as well. So um, we talk about um, a system of free trade in a liberal world order, but of course it, it isn't free at all. It's based on um, massive coercion, government coercion on a grand scale. And probably one of the worst examples is uh, you know the Suez Canal, which transits around um, a billion tons of, uh, no sorry, it's, yeah, it's a billion, yeah, a billion tons of goods a year. And that was built with slave labor uh, by the uh, colonists uh, with 120,000 slaves being killed in its construction. And so if you're gonna have these long trade routes, then inevitably you, if you're talking about sea routes, 
you're inevitably going to have to have bases along the, the trade routes in order to secure these, um, you know, the ships and to refuel them, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in a sort of long-term secure way. Hence, you know, Singapore and Hong Kong and those sort of colonial outposts. So if you, uh, this sort of uh, long-distance trade is basically intertwined with empire almost inevitably. Or if you think about land, um, land trade routes, you know, think about you know, a country like Russia, um, where it's basically um, boxed in by um, other European countries and has very poor access to warm water ports. Um, in that kind of situation, um, and also you know, huge, vast areas of landlocked territory as well. Once again, that means in order to secure trade routes, access to the sea, um, it's going to massively encourage uh, these vast empires as well, just the logistics of that. So if, if, it, if they're under threat of being boxed in by um, Western European powers who are hostile, um, and Turkey as well, obviously, because of the access to the Mediterranean, then that explains why there's this massive impetus, even though it's hugely expensive to build the Trans-Siberian Railway um, using basically serf labour to get access to the Pacific. And during World War II, that was probably what saved them. So it was a rational, rational thing, because that's vast amounts of um, food and material came over that route from, from the US. So once again, this is a problem. If you, these countries were fragmented, these big landlocked countries were fragmented, then it'd be a massive problem for trade. Um, and okay, you could try and um, you know come up with some sort of voluntary agreement, but then you're sort of getting into sort of EU territory that has incentives, public choice incentives to centralise power because the bureaucrats want more power. Um, it sort of becomes a uh, sort of de facto empire by accident anyway. So th that's no solution really. Um, so this is this is another difficult problem with the secession argument. But obviously that only applies to certain regions. It wouldn't necessarily apply to islands that have um, access to the sea. It also is contingent on a certain level of technology as well. Um, for example, you know, rail is a dominant mode of land, long distance land transport. But I think um, the really, really um, difficult problem with these smaller units is um, you know, how on earth can they defend themselves assuming that um, you know, much of the rest of the world is dominated by large empires. And we see, see a pattern here where um, there are very few examples of um, smaller, smaller jurisdictions that have dissented from the big empires that have managed to survive for very long. Um, so, you know, one example is maybe um, Afghanistan, uh, but that's got a particular particularly uh, difficult terrain for any invaders. It's known as the graveyard of empires. Um, but he, so clearly Afghanistan has paid a very, very heavy price in the long run from, uh, for maintaining its independence. Um, you see, you know, um, any sort of African country that tried to, um, tried to free itself from uh, near imperialism, uh, basically found itself being crushed by uh, puppet neighbours, uh, you know, the Western intelligence agencies who you know, deposed the uh, dissident leader. Um, so this is really difficult. So, I mean, James C. Scott in his, um, his book, The Art of Not Being Governed, gives one example, which is the, um, the people of Zomia in, in Southeast Asia who've managed to avoid being captured by these surrounding empires and they've more or less maintained their independent way of life. But once again, they, they've paid a very heavy cost um, for this. So they've sort of, this sort of um, resistance to state control has uh, sort of become embedded in their culture. So what they did is they, they moved to the, the mountainous areas um, to avoid conquest by the Han Chinese or the Thais or, or these various empires that, that were surrounding them. Um, and they also, Issued uh, uh, literacy, uh, so they couldn't be sort of measured by these governments, and uh, adopted a semi-nomadic uh, lifestyle, so they couldn't really be pinned down. They'd move from you know one area of forested mountain to another area, and in this way they could more or less avoid problems being incorporated into these huge empires. But 
you know, the question is, I mean, there are, I suppose, North Koreas, perhaps, I, mean, I don't you know, sub- uh, support its particular political model, but that has managed to resist for a very long time. It, is that really true, though, because it's basically being supported by its big brother in China? Uh, if it hadn't had the connivance of, of China over the years, which is still going on with the, you know, the, the, trade, the trade and so on and the use of North Korean workers in return for remittances, I don't think it probably could have survived. Um, um, you know, some of these, some of these very mountainous, remote countries perhaps can resist. But let's um, you know think about some sort of libertarian utopia. Um, so, if they allowed um, if they allowed drug dealers uh, free reign, I mean, how long would it be for, before the U.S. just bombed the crap out of the place? Probably not very long. Or you know, they or be surround blockaded by various Western navies to stop the the trade going in and out. Um, so this is this is quite a pressing thought. And then it wouldn't um, enjoy the economies of scale that I mentioned earlier because it would probably start off quite small. You know, it might be able to perhaps um, um, provide some sort of uh, uh, niche uh, trades and so on. But once again, if it, if these were areas that were were frowned upon, even you know, tax havens are getting. Uh, pushed more and more under the thumb by these um, supranational regulators and you're seeing financial privacy being killed and you know Switzerland basically surrendering to the US on financial privacy and same with the Cayman Islands and so on. Um, so my conclusion is um, given that these, these, there are these um, immense challenges facing small jurisdictions that secede uh, from these larger empires, I think really um, in most cases, uh, I mean, given the um, given the uh, the challenges they face, I think it, in most cases they would need to be a certain sort of size before they could manage to sustain themselves in the long term. Because it would be pointless to secede from one of these empires just to become sort of absorbed in a much larger power. And I think this is a problem for for Scotland, Scotland actually, given the weakness of its economy. I think. The chances are that um, if it did secede from the UK, it would just become basically a puppet for either the EU or, or you know, basically the, the continental powers, which it, it used to be before as well, before before the Union, uh, you know, the old alliance with France, for example. So I think yes, uh, secession is a good idea, but basically the the new units that are formed from it need to be of a certain critical mass so they can both defend themselves and also. Um, um, exploit these economies of scale that are necessary for a, a healthy economy. I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. That was uh, uh, a commendably neutral analysis of the modern problem of empires. Uh, I'm going to invite you to be a little less neutral. Uh, it seems to me that, in reality, there are, there are two empires in the world that we need to worry about, one considerably more than the other. The main one that we need to worry about is, is the American empire, which is armed to the teeth, uh, aggressive, uh, generally run by people who are either stupid or possibly dangerous, uh, and very extraterritorial, sorry, extraterritorial in its approach to work. So, for example, the attacks on financial privacy and so forth. Generally, you'll find all those things come from the Americans and, uh, and affect almost all of us. The EU it, it tends to copy the Americans. The ideas come from America. It's not quite as aggressive. And I think it's less sure of, of its own position, particularly in the light of the UK Brexit. So, well, sorry, that's quite a long-winded introduction to my question, which is what do you think, if anything, is going to lead, let's say, within our general lifetimes, to the demise, in particular, of the American empire? Or is that empire going to continue and become stronger and stronger out of all the things? Yeah, I, I personally think it will, um, it, it will kind of wither away fairly quickly. Um, the question is whether it takes the rest of the world down with it. 
it sort of lashes out like a, a dying animal. Why do you think it's going to wither away? I mean, it's been getting stronger and stronger. Well, it in hasn't. In terms of aggressiveness over the last few years. But the point is, um, there's a there's a lag time in terms of military strength and um, and GDP as measured by purchasing power parity. So you'll find that um, the U so China is now a bigger economy than the US measured on properly measured in terms of purchasing power parity, and that divide will, will grow. And you probably also see um, India rising to sort of a similar level, maybe in 20 or 30 years time. And of course, basically power parity is what matters for the military, because that's how much stuff you can actually produce, uh, you know, weapons, hardware, etc, etc. Okay, there's a technological advantage. But once again, that's partly, that would be eroded by this lag time. So maybe sort of 20 or 30 years, but then it's no longer the, the major military power. And also, I remember... Looking at how old I am, <laughs> 30 years, <laughs> but the, other, the point is that um, already um, you're seeing uh, a, lot, a lot more competition, imperialist competition, for example, the, the new scramble for Africa uh, versus... So, so, so is your answer that the American empire may fade, but it's only going to fade because it's going to be replaced by other empires? Well, I think that, I think that's right. Yes, and, and which is, is depre it is depressing, um, but yeah, the the point is that you can't sort of you can't sort of carry sort of um, divorce military and foreign policy strength from GDP. So it's not the end of that old all empires. It's just the end of that particular one. That's right. Replaced by some other. I, I actually think um, India India has all the hallmarks of being an, a very aggressive empire if its economy picks up just because it's got very few natural resources of its own. So we'll have to start making deals with, particularly I think East Africa is probably going to be um, under threat from the Indians. And, and you're going to get a, a you know, massive amount of proxy wars in uh, you know, Rwanda, uh, Eastern, Eastern Congo area where there are these huge natural resources. Um, and who's going to, who's going to you know, the, prime, the prime sort of imperialist um, property is the Persian Gulf, of course. And that's uh, an area where you'll see a lot of competition because America's incentive to, to police this area Do you is see no the long... Indians fighting in global war on drugs, for example? Uh, no, they, I think they, 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 they don't have the same culture to do that. Well, I hope not. They, you know, they have pretty, a pretty sort of draconian government, though. You know, this borderline police state with all this um, you know, enforced ID cards and banning cash, etc. So there are already worrying sort of developments in India. So that's the one to watch for. And China's obviously an empire. If you, if you were a Uyghur or a Tibetan, you wouldn't claim that China wasn't an empire. And it, it needs this, this land route to, to Europe, you know, to Kazakhstan, Russia, Belarus, and Poland. So any of those, any of those countries, you know, particularly their, their lives be effectively just become puppets. Obviously not Russia, but as long as Russia and China, you know, are, are fairly friendly, the others are just gonna be in the way and just be crushed. Yeah, thanks for the talk, very interesting. I, I'm wondering, um, because this is obviously, uh, I think, the, the, the central problem to any kind of, uh, of, of libertarian experiments, because, you, you, you know, there are lots of libertarians who think, well, if, if we all had Liechtensteins and then these kind of things, I think, yeah, in this world that wouldn't work. But I wonder if, 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 if you really need an empire or whether you just need to be uh, a big in, enough area that basically agrees on, on some basically free trade, which I think in Europe that, that might work very well. If, if we had genuine free trade and, uh, and free movement of people, then uh, and, and in all other respects we would, just, we would just get rid of Brussels essentially. Uh, it would be difficult to, even for an empire, to control this huge amount of people in, 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 in Europe because there's no center <coughs> that they could, could, could influence. And, and on its own, these, these half billion people in Europe uh, would be difficult to bully because they, they, would, they, would, they would be in itself such a huge economy that, uh, that uh, they would probably take uh, a few blackmails from, from an empire to, to threaten that they won't trade with you or whatever. I think, I think the problem with that is that if, if um, certain countries um, decided to um, adopt sort of anti-free trade policies and rebel from that yeah. loose neat, neat union. Particularly, if, say, if, um, if Germany did that, um, and that's kind of the keystone in a sense, it's a natural core of, of Europe, because 
um, all these countries to the east of it in order to get their goods to Rotterdam also the and the you know the main trade routes they have to they have to pass through Germany which is why it's the natural um, dominant player in in Europe um, so if in that situation or even if you know a smaller one that has some sort of strategic significance dissented and started creating these barriers and then you know some, say some some of the landlocked countries like um, um, you know um, Slovakia or, or Hungary were basically trapped then you start seeing the incentives for some sort of far more draconian type of um, such, yeah, empire effectively that has to crush these dissenting countries just basically to keep the sort of basic economic structure afloat. But, but the EU doesn't seem to solve that because Germany obviously is also in the EU a very good player and if Germany decides to get out of the EU and then close borders so much the EU could do against it. So either Germany uh, accepts that this order, that some kind of free trade order is is good good for for it, or um, or or it doesn't. And That's right. I think it has to be grounded in a in a, a culture of. Yeah. of you know, broadly pro-liberty culture, and that's a, obviously a problem. Um, and then, if you know, some countries aren't like that. Say, Southern European countries don't have that same culture by a long shot. I don't. I don't like these um, economic freedom indexes. I think they're very superficial in many ways. But all these corruption indexes, or etc. But they, you know, the, the differences are horrifying between uh, Northwest Europe and, and Southern Europe and Eastern Europe, which are. Yes, they're sort of mid-table in terms of these corruption ind indices and pretty bad on the economic freedom indices. So, yeah, if you don't have this shared culture, then you have a you know sort of a a liberal a liberal elite trying to then crush these non-liberal countries because they then lose their liberalism. These elites because they're engaging deeply liberal policies to get their own way. That's the that's the problem. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, I'm myself from Belarus, so I know quite a lot about you know suppression by big empires. And what I can say about this is that, uh, like a small player on the map, like Belarus, can absorb this tendency to be uh, economically controlled by uh, big states like Russia or China. Because what I can absorb now from my own China. Uh, countries that we are deep in depth with Russia and we are selling our land and property to China and Russia because we're right in the middle of between Eastern and Western mm. blocks. And the big problem is that smaller players on this map they have all they have strong economy to protect themselves with this economic ties so they can't be attacked because they're economically important or they have some nuclear weapon to protect themselves. So if you can really protect yourself with economy or weapon, then you are just ruled by all this power quite very easily. And it's like uh, Belarus ruled both, even tries by Russia and by Germany because we got these tubes of gas which moves through us mm -hmm. in Germany. So we need to submit to both Europe and Russia. And now China appears as well and they're just buying our land and factories to make cheaper goods and sell them to Europe faster. So our country is really like, a, I'm sorry, like a prostitute, you know, on this map. And it's not funny anymore when you are actually living there and, uh, to to protect and, you know, like to keep this country submissive, they need to eliminate our culture. So like, I myself will be speaking Russian all my life, so we got our language. But, I've been speaking Russian all my life because uh, they, that's how they do it. And I myself, uh, hard to say if I'm a national state of empire because it's a complicated question. But what I can absorb uh, is that empire demands total elimination of culture and um, you know this individuality of the country. So of course they grant you power and protection, but it's more like, you know, wrecking exactly. Yeah, I think that's absolutely fascinating. I, I didn't realize that that was, I knew that about the Russian influence, but what you said about China echoes what they're doing in, in Africa, where they're, you know, they're um, buying vast amounts of land and also putting these cheap loans out. Effectively, they, they use these to basically pay off the elites in a lot of countries, the countries like Zambia, 
Um, and then the you know, people of Zambia, the taxpayers, are lumbered with these massive debts and are basically in, in hop to China ad infinitum for these new infrastructure projects. Um, and it's, it's kind of just a, another, another form of imperialism, uh, but by a different uh, imperial master. But yeah, and the problem is, as I said, especially now when Ukraine is um, after the putsch in Ukraine, uh, backed by the West, um, obviously Belarus is now part of this very small number of countries uh, to link the, you know, the two uh, natural cores of the global economy, two of the three natural cores of the global economy, which are Western Europe and Eastern China. So uh, it's inevitable that any, any country along that new Silk Road is likely to be crushed by these huge empires, including the EU potentially as well. So you know, Poland, is, Poland I, I suspect, as historically has always been the problem, is, is once again sort of in the middle of these, these huge power games between the empires. Uh, Bob and then David. I'm not an imperialist, but um, one can say that the British in India, for example, I've held, and one day I will check to see if it's true, the fact they allow goods in from all other nations, you know, transported on their own ships if need be, but of course if ships weren't as good as ours, uh, and the goods weren't as good as ours, so it's no wonder the people in India decided to have British stuff. But I don't think they were obliged to have it. And um, well, how would that stand? That doesn't look quite so um, so, so desperate. Yeah, I, I, I read a recent paper that was saying that the, the British deliberately imposed uh, taxes on Indian manufacturing in order to allow in oh. the um, British uh, manufacturers. And, and once again, that's a way of capturing these vast, massive economies of scale by increasing the size of the markets, um, which is China's game as well. And also, uh, you know, the US plays this game with the tech industry with its, its government subsidising these um, you know, winner take, takes all tech giants. So because you know, of these economies of scale, you, you get network benefits, etc. Network economies. Um, though, at one time, the biggest firm in the world was Nestle, and you know where Nestle mm. comes from? Switzerland. Yes, it's one of the smallest firms. So you can get the economies of scale in a small. Yeah, but country yeah, like but, Switzerland. Yeah, but Switzerland, Switzerland's or it's always been a. A satellite country of these bigger powers, and it you know it's not not properly independent. Which is showed recently with the you know kowtowing completely to the uh, U.S. on financial privacy, and it's also people don't know this is also in uh, NATO's um, quote partnership for peace. So it's effectively a, a NATO member. So it's still it's part it's part of this Western Empire effectively. So it's got it's kind of been. It's quite so it's the same with these little countries like Andorra and you know, yeah, it's like Monaco is effectively Monaco. it's effectively part of France in terms of the security relationship. But they, they're sometimes tolerated because they're convenient for the elites, um, as Switzerland has been historically as a sort of you know, neutral place to do business away from these wider conflicts. And then Iceland was a little country, wasn't it? That was the richest in the world before the nineteen. Uh, uh, so 2008. Yeah, sure. That's why I said that some of these small countries that have, um, if they've got vast natural resources and a small population, then they can be very wealthy. But remember, you know, Iceland um, historically has never been properly independent, and the only reason it's sort of not really independent now. So it's in the EEA, the single market. But at the same time, it's basically. Um, it's basically a, a U.S. satellite for it because of its strategic position in the Atlantic. So, um, you know, the, the U.S. has been basically protecting Iceland. It used to be a colony of the other Scandinavian countries. I forget which one. Uh, um, Norway. Norway originally, wasn't it? Because that's where they come from, yeah. Thanks, David? Yeah, uh, so, uh, I actually had two completely different questions. The first was to the... Uh, the chap from Belarus. It, it, it's quite interesting how the way that you word something can kind of change mm. people's perspectives. The Chinese are buying factories. That sounds really bad. But the Chinese companies are investing in Belarus. It might sound better. You know, in fact, it might be it's really the trade that we want. So the point is that they're buying land and they're building factories by themselves. Then 
uh, Chinese workers migrate to our country to work on these factories. All profit goes back to China. All goods sold to Europe. So everything, like, only thing we got, like, a country is that these workers will live on our territory and will spend their salary on our territory. But everything else, including the project, and everything is done by China for China. And all we got is that they will forgive us some debts. So you can say, yeah, then investing in us, maybe one day we will like privacy scientists and factories and say, okay, they will, they will be ours. But I don't think that country like us will say something like this to China. It looks more like a conquest, economical conquest, because uh, Ago, we got almost no other people but Belarusians. Last summer, I've been to Belarus, even in my own neighborhood. I've seen uh, Chinese people, I've seen opening you know, like Chinese restaurants, and some teenagers uh, who were talking Chinese around, and I was like, oh, what's going on? It's, it's strange. We got some Chinese inscriptions on our roads, and um, Maybe, yeah, they're investing, but they're investing in themselves. They're not investing in our country in particular, because we've got like 10, maybe 15% from this investment, but maybe they just investing in themselves. So, where, so how the factories get built, where does the electricity come from, where they're spending the salaries, where the food come from? Yeah, this, this I said, but it's like 10, 15%, maybe, maybe more. I, I'm not so sure, I've never seen this number, but... Uh, the point is they they, they, do, they invest in loss-making stuff that doesn't make any economic sense, but it does make sense when you think about the geopolitics. So they invest in these crazy railways in um, Xinjiang province in the middle of the Gobi Desert. And you think, why on earth are they doing that? But it's, they're doing that because of their long-term geopolitical you know, objectives. The same in Zambia, these crazy infrastructure schemes there in, in Tanzania. So if you look at the passive investment, it doesn't have to bear any obvious economic relevance. Uh, rationale from a sort of profit perspective. It's all about you know, the Chinese state driving uh, this pattern of investment for geopolitical reasons. And it's also about migration. Like they got too many people in our country. It's, you know, in the size of UK, we got 10 million people, so like six or seven times less than the UK. And we got a lot of space, and people are migrating. You know, they got jobs uh, in our country. So <laughs> <laughs> if, 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 uh, if you finish, please. John, uh, and then Mr. Uh, David, and then Bob. Rather than looking at this from the point of view of people seceding and how economically viable they could be, uh, as long as they have some military alliances, presumably, uh, what about <coughs> expelling? parts of the country which are a bit of a pain but, and dragging you down. Don't mention Liverpool. Uh, <laughs> Liverpool is on my list. <laughs> <laughs> Only Scotland is number one. <laughs> yeah, so you could have a referendum about kicking bits of the oh, UK yes. out. Yeah. 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 They, not, they don't just have a right to decide whether they want to be we have a right to decide whether we want to kick them out. The, the, the problem with that, though, is um, this sort of idea of natural boundaries, and there would be these economic externalities in terms of defence if we didn't have control over the whole of the coastline for, for an island. So if they became, let's say, Scotland had become, was independent during World War II, that would have been an absolute nightmare. It would have had to be invaded like uh, Iceland was because of its strategic significance at huge cost. And that's if you know the German paratroopers hadn't already landed there. Well, we can we can protect them, but it will cost them in taxation. <laughs> they just don't get any hand up. Well, well, this is this is the sort of bargaining thing with England and Scotland. You know that um, England basically pays because of the, the strategic significance of Scotland and Northern Ireland as well. Uh, well, exactly, because it means that they, they if if the whole island of Ireland became a sort of vassal state of some hostile empire, it would be a, a nightmare for uh, Britain. Oh, the fence is there. Um, just go here, sure. then, and then, and then you move on. Oh, the gentleman from Belarus is gone. Yeah. Yeah, we'll yeah. Oh, so you can move on to someone else, because okay. my question was mm. for him. Okay, right. It
Um, people think that the only good that comes of um, companies are wages and profits and do them. No, the good that comes from companies are goods. <laughs> things, that, things that are made. That's the point. And it doesn't really matter around who owns, who gets, who gets the profits, who gets the dividends, who earns the wages. The important thing is that something useful has turned out using some things that were quite less useful when they started. So, that's a more general point. Yeah, so excellent point. You yes. think that it depends massively upon who, who's being employed, are they ours, are they this? Obviously, if there's, if there's intimidation or it's made uh, you have to have a license to do certain things that's wrong but beyond that if people just turn up and make something yeah uh, yeah but i'd say you know the, the, uh, there's a lot more state capitalism going on than, than we'd like to you know sort of acknowledge i mean look at uh, a company like bp for example how it used to be anglo-iranian oil and it was all mixed up with empire and then it you know, think about the a famine in Biafra that the British government supported, uh, you know, the Niger Nigerian federal government basically so that Shell and P BP could get the oil contracts for that region. So this this state capitalism or crony capitalism broadly defined is much, you know, m sadly much wider than yes. a lot of classical liberals acknowledge. Uh, now, uh, what do yes. you, uh, hello, my, uh, hi, my question was for you because when you were talking, everything you said it really spoke to me because I'm originally from Africa and although initially I was quite optimistic and supportive of the Chinese-African relationship when it, it was all underpinned by the language of win-win and uh, a difference from what had been experienced with the Western world which approached African nations generally with a heavy-handed approach I was really startled by what's happening in your country because it equals some of what's happening in Africa, which we should refer to, especially in Zambia, which has been in the headline recently, when Africans and Chinese had a summit in China. So I wanted to ask you, because I, I can see from here, that lots of people in Africa, activists, are now starting to come up and denounce what's going on with China, exposing a lot of the practices of the Chinese, so as to say, we may resent our old colonial powers and uh, have, you know, what, uh, be prepared to open up with China, but we're very wary that she becomes the same, if not worse. Uh, and then, and you can tell that the Chinese are very, very scared of this sort of movement, and they're, they're trying to get some PR out to to calm this down. Do you have anything like that in your country? Like people who are starting to rise and denounce you know, uh, what's starting so that it doesn't get any worse. The same year uh, at which I was born, we got the president and he's still a president. So our people are really submissive, that's what I could say. We used to be uh, under USSR, then we were under Russia, and now we are like under everybody and people are just... Our dictatorship is based on the poorness of people, so if people are poor, they can't. If there is no middle class, nobody could uh, revolt. So we got no power, no actual power in people. And because of this, people are just like in the stream, you know. Everything that happened, people are like, yeah, it could be bad, it could be good, but if government said that it's good to be friends with China, people said, all right, it's, it's all right. So, we have a few countries exactly like that in Africa, whereby you can tell that there isn't really much opposition. But the advantage of it being a continent is that you do get well, those places China is where a strong country, and it's like a law of attraction. It's, it's physical law, it's not even a social law. <laughs> if there is a bigger player, little player stand to, you know, attract to it. And now people, they felt like this about Russia, but now China is even bigger than Russia. People said, right, like, Putin is not too big now. Now we got China as a friend, but they don't realize that there is no friendship with China. There is China. And I, mean, um, well, I mean, I'm here for a reason. I'm talking with you in English for a reason. It's, uh, it's quite complicated <laughs> issue in our country. Are you an activist yourself? Um, my family is involved in politics some way, but I myself is neutral as possible because I see like 
the more I study politics, the more I understand the country has to pursue their own goals. They're not trying to, you know, like, they're not evil. They're just for their own interests. It's normal for human beings. If you could, I would pe perhaps recommend that you invite the people of your country to have connections to look very closely at what's happening in Africa at the moment because it's an interest, interesting place to observe what China might become in the years to come behind all the rhetoric of win-win and a different way of doing the economy and all the rest of it. So. Yeah. Thanks, mm -hmm. uh, Paul, and then David, and then uh, Pat. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of this geopolitics uh, has, you know, does have a logic of its own, mm -hmm. but um, it, it's not it's not it's not acting in principle. What, what drives a lot of this is a lot of bad ideas about the place, bad ideas like nationalism and that way to get rich is by exploiting other people and things. But yeah, what needs to be driven out? These bad ideas and good ideas about individual liberty, the free market, and security of property rights is about yeah the Brit Britain sort of led the way in this region. It became corrupt. Right? Socialists arrived, telling us wrong things, but um, among others. But uh, but yeah, the, the fact that Britain was a sort of fairly liberal country and had a fairly liberal empire, an imperial instinct itself, not necessarily. Uh, liberal, but uh, the idea was free trade, security of property rights, not everything utterly corrupt and bought off. It's these bad ideas that need to be driven out. But a lot of bad ideas have been driven out. Communism, which absolutely dominated Russia and China, where absolutely millions of people are starving to death and all over the place. So I think it's much better now. Uh, I mean, Belarus, I don't know, you know, it's probably a bit rough living there now, but it seems to me it's probably a lot better than it was 20 years ago, or even 50 years ago, where I think it would be absolutely horrific. Um, and uh, the, so, yeah, the, the European Union is driven by a lot of bad, bad and silly ideas, not the worst ideas in the world, you know, relating to probably North Korea maybe, but we've got to drive out the bad ideas. There is a security problem, but the more other people adopt similar liberal ideas, the less we need to worry. We don't, we don't defend ourselves particularly against the Americans uh, in any kind of military sense now. Of course, the Americans have got bad ideas about extrajudicial, but it's, yeah, America is going to be where Ron Paul does get quite close to, you know, he runs for the presidency, and he says what's wrong with all this. The ideas are there in America. It could stop you know, this sort of silly neocon policy and become more libertarian. And other countries, other countries could as well. Small states can, you know, you know people can mock Bonaco and Liechtenstein, but these are small states, but they've done very well for themselves. They have to accommodate big powers. The girl who stripped the small state is absolutely full of bad ideas. She's why it's such a shithole. There's no reason why two little strips on the Mediterranean couldn't equally be really prosperous. The Gaza Strip could, if it had a complete change of ideology in mind, become a super little, you know, tax haven for the world's rich, have some yachts there, you know, a few drinks in your Grand Prix, you know, sort of a casino. They could do all of that, but they don't, you know. They're, 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 they're not allowed to, Paul, are they? They're, they're not allowed. allowed. They're blockaded. <laughs> well, they're blockaded. <laughs> they're blockaded because they don't do that. If they said this is what we're going to do, they wouldn't be blockaded. So, bad ideas rather than anything intrinsic. Yeah, but there's, there is a logic of geopolitics, but it can be overcome through better ideas. Yeah, and I'd agree with that. And of course, the um, the fall of communism is a great example of where this jurisdictional competition is really important. It really um, illustrates the point because East Germans are looking over the border and seeing, you know, the same basically the same other Germans who are four or five times as well off as they were. Um, so, you know, that, that's why it's so important that you do have this jurisdictional competition. Where I would disagree with you, though, is about, the, about Britain, because it, I mean, come on, this so-called free trade was just brutal empire in practice. So that, that was the downside of the liberalisation of the Corn Laws, because, it, of course, it meant all these, provided the massive incentives for um, these uh, genociders to go off to Argentina or, or the US and turf the... Um, Native Americans off their territory to create these massive farms to export stuff to, to Europe. Um, so you know it was a it was a, it was a brutal empire. Pro property rights were weren't too bad. Well, even even in the UK, I mean, you had the enclosures and you're in you know the, the peasants being tur turfed off their land and all the rest of it. So it was property rights for the elite, but yeah, it's true. It's true. But, but, but slavery was defeated through genuine moral horror in this mm. country. 
before anywhere else, you know, long before the seceding United States got around. I mean, it was about 50 yep. years that it took them to. Yeah, but the problem is, the problem is the um, you know capitalism had um, industrialized slavery on a on an unprecedented scale before that. So you know, there's the uh, it was you know the but on the plus side, you know, the the ideas of classical liberalism, the um, you know, invisible hand type ideas did feed into that that, that gravy form eventually. David, what do you think? You think uh, Pat? Yeah, uh, just on what we were talking about, about investment, Chinese involvement and investment in uh, Africa and Belarus. I mean, we invited the, the Chinese government here, the, 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 the Premier, come here. We were begging for uh, involvement here. And indeed, uh, some of the uh, HS2, uh, the, the mainland it, it is being uh, financed with Chinese money. Uh, we're begging for investment. I mean, if, if Africa and Belarus, Belarus don't want Chinese investment, this country would soak it. And they have. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it's, it's less of a problem, though, because they obviously got a much uh, deeper uh, and larger um, you know, asset values in the UK would have been a you know, bigger, richer economy. So the, the chances of it being sort of uh, incorporated by some sort of neo imperialist strategy are much lower than it is for smaller, poorer countries. Bob? Speaking facetiously, um, the, Isle of, the Isle of Wight is rather the same size and shape as, as, a, as um, Singapore. <laughs> And it might be ceded to the Chinese <laughs> <laughs> for a hundred years or something. Yes, it might. Could be. Yeah, front. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, well, the, the, the Greek government is seriously considering selling off some of the Greek islands to Germany, actually, on that basis. I don't know why they didn't. Because they're not being used. <laughs> Except <laughs> 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 that people living there. They're not going to always live in there. Not in there. Yeah, they have a good, good point. Anyone else? Just, just a small point about, I, I think that colonialism is different when you, you talked about Ameri Native Americans uh, being displaced. They didn't really have any concept of ownership of the land. They didn't have cities and, and they, they were nomadic. And so I think that's completely different to displacing a people that lives in a fixed place. I really do think that's a completely different thing. So, so when 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 the Europeans went to America and established fixed settlements, I think that was morally okay. Although I, I don't believe that they should have persecuted the natives, but they didn't really have any concept of ownership of that place. Yeah, I mean that's the problem with with um, sort of imposing a, a sort of European Eurocentric model of of property, though I think. Because they did definitely have well-defined territories, as you always find with these, you know, hunter-gatherer type societies. So they did, effectively, you know, with the other tribes, they had just a fairly sure, well. Sure. Do you not see the difference between displacing these sort of people don't really use the land at all? They don't make the best use of it. Yeah, versus... they made them. But well, you just, you're you're saying what's the best? You're. You're deciding what's I the best use. Be as, as productive and using... support as many people as possible. That's that's the best use for them. Well, they they, they might prefer to to be battery, poor, happy. battery cages. Yeah. <laughs> Churn those humans out. No, but don't you see the difference? I think I think there is a moral difference between the two. No, no, I think that's just sort really? of so, yeah, just applying. So we should, we should never have America and Canada and all, all of that would never have been created if, if, if Europeans never went there and, and, and well, if they, yeah, if they if they deployed the non-aggression uh, principle, they they wouldn't have been sure, they wouldn't have been giving the the Native Americans uh, blankets. They were infected sure, with smallpox. The natives didn't have an immigration policy either. They weren't accepting of foreigners. They they were savages and they, they attacked them in a lot of places. Well, yeah, because they were they were entering onto their territory. Yeah. It's like you know, attacking a burglar, basically, isn't it? Sure, they don't have a concept of maps or, or anything like that. They just had it wasn't it wasn't a sophisticated society. But they had a concept that this was their territory, and someone came in. Yeah, and that is was trying to kill them. Yeah. yeah. Surely the surely the in a sense this debate is is sort of missing the point, which is that you could, you can certainly come to a place like. America as it was in the late 18th century, early 19th century, and offer 
frayed and yeah. It, it did that as well, it wasn't they, just pretty well, like, yeah, yeah, for a couple yeah. of beats. Well, yeah. okay, okay, fine, fine. But, you know, I mean, these things aren't easy, but you know, it's, it's not that the choice is between nothing at all and never stepping foot in North America and killing everybody. You know, they're, they're all, I mean, there are kind of. Well, I mean, until about uh, 1875. It was the late 19th century. Well, until about 1875, the gun. It's yeah. less efficient in the longbow, yeah. not longbow, the actual Indian bows. But Pat? Yeah, I'm just going to, yeah, I'm just going to come down to that, that point. I mean, it, it just it builds on technological advancement, doesn't it? I mean, the, the, even the early colonists in, in uh, oh, well, right over the Americans, I mean, most of them were wiped out. Certainly the British, the British ones, it, and they just disappeared. And no one's ever heard of them. The, thir the first colonies. The same happened in South America. But you go back to, I mean, the Vikings tried to, even the Vikings tried to establish colonies in the Americans. No, the Vikings, yeah, I mean, the, the, see, the new idea, no, I'm talking too, too much here, but let me just say this, the new idea that arose in the late 18th century was looking back to the, to the mother country, and we can call that idea, the idea of colonialism. Now, when the Vikings went to America, they didn't look back. I mean, and, and 1066 illustrates this. Uh, you had the Normans, who were completely alienated from the Vikings, who invaded England in the north of England in 1066. So, we fought, you know, so uh, Harold fought on two sides, the pristine Vikings and the Norman French. And they were kind of like, but they didn't look back. In the, in the 18th century, they started looking back to the mother country. That's when you had the development of colonialism. Yeah, the point I was making is not... not Whichever way they look, back or forward or sideways or whatever, they didn't have the technological advantage over the native Indians at the time until, well, well, well until uh, you know America was, was first discovered. Well, I mean, the gun, the, 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 yes. the, 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 the gun couldn't have the, 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 the bow at all. Yeah. Surprisingly, right? But I'm talking. But too even much even, here. even, even yeah. with guns, it, it, that wasn't much of an advantage anyway because. The colonists that were wiped out actually had guns. They had firearms, but they were still all. all no, I'm saying the, the, until about 18, 15, 1875. This is a surprising thing, but since the study of history by Hornby, and I guess it's right. It's a paradox, anyhow. It was, even if it's wrong, it's an interesting, wrong idea. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that the uh, the uh, guns were inferior to the bows. Now, the, uh, the, the Japanese rejected the gun in favor of the sword uh, because they held that the sword was superior to the gun. That's another well, they other thing. Wrong. They were completely wrong there, weren't they? Well, uh, <laughs> yeah. not, not really. I mean, they, they, did, they didn't lose out through that, and all the Red Indians lose out through that. It's, it's, only, just that, it's, just it's that. only the Winchester 75 that, 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 that uh, put the uh, settlers on part of the Indians. What are you talking about? Is it terrorist insurgents who know that the area? And you've got someone who doesn't, you know, and they're overwhelmed by locals. That, 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 We're talking about the efficiency of the bow. Uh, the efficiency yeah, of the bow in, 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 uh, was. But who's uh, better to fear the, the, the bow than those who's going to come out on top? The efficiency of the no, bow. In, I mean, let me just say this. The efficiency of the bow <laughs> in North America. Uh, speaker, I'm sorry. <laughs> the efficiency of the bow in North America. <laughs> repeated the efficiency of the bow in, in the Mongol, from the Mongol Empire. Mm -hmm. the, the, sorry. No, I don't know anything about bows, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Except the... <laughs> <laughs> can, can, can I make a point, though? So, yeah. Europeans came over with, with the rule of law and, and property rights, whereas... And diseases. And, well, yeah, yeah. that's what But uh, the, the, the natives had okay. just the rule of man. It was the whim of the chief. It was not an equivalent society. No, they had customary law, didn't they? You know, no, rules. It wasn't the same. It wasn't, well, consistent. It wasn't the same. It wasn't consistent. They had no, no concept of property and ownership the way, the way it was enshrined in Europe. Well, they did, they did have some, like, you know, if there'd be a, if they'd send them to grow crops and there would be some individual ownership at that sort of a scale. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you think that Brexit will eventually lead to the crumbling of the European Empire, the EU mm. Empire? Yeah, I think um, it's unlikely in the medium term because I think um, the UK is kind of unique um, in a couple of respects. Um, firstly, it's one of the you know, larger 
um, EU economies, which is, is helpful in terms of you know, these economies of scale, I was mentioned before. And secondly, I think apart from Malta, it has the highest share of trade with the rest of the world vis-a-vis -vis other EU countries, um, which makes it kind of unique. Um, and also, you know, culturally being an island as well, there's sort of a, a cultural issue of it not really feeling part of, of the EU. Um, so I, I think a lot of the, the particularly these um, southern and eastern European countries, they're pretty much hooked on EU subsidies and the, the costs of them trying to get out would be, would be immense, just the you know, sort of short-term disruption. And as we know, politicians are always sort of looking towards the next election, very short-term viewpoint. So the sort of short-term costs of, say, Hungary leaving would be immense because it's you know, a landlocked country that's completely pretty much surrounded, apart from Serbia, by the EU. So, you know, much harder for other countries to leave. I think Ireland could leave if... Um, so, you see, if the UK went down the um, clean Brexit route, then Ireland could be in deep trouble um, and then at the same time, if the EU adopts its tax harmonisation policies, it could completely screw Ireland's um, tax havens uh, which, um, status, which is really the source of its current um, high standard of living. So there's a potential there, but obviously his the history, not wanting to be a, a UK vassal, makes Ireland uh, leaving very difficult. You might see the Irish voting to join the UK. Yeah, I can't see that happening because of their history, but I think, I think because of the, um, the, the only danger is if the EU go down the tax harmonisation route, that could be deadly for the Irish economy. But I think they, they'll probably give the, keep giving the Irish a sort of turning a blind eye to the Irish situation because it's you know, for political reasons they don't want anyone else to leave. Check the book, Richard. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.